Thank you for being here for our Sunday morning Bible class. So glad you're able to join us. If you're visiting with us, thank you so much for choosing to be here at this time and pray that you'll take an opportunity anytime you are able to, to get on our YouTube channel to look up our other services that we recorded as well as Bible classes. To our church family that are unable to be here, so thankful that you're able to be here with this technology and pray as always that you and your family are doing well and that you're safe and that you're happy. As always, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much for the blessing of it. We thank you so much for waking us up, Father. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to open up your word, to study from it. we have so thankful for the blessing of our families, Father. Pray that you'll continue to bless our families and strengthen us as we walk with you. We thank you for this time that we might uh, learn how to draw closer to each other, to, uh, to increase uh, the harmony within our homes, to build our homes upon that rock, which is your son, Jesus Christ. And we're so thankful for the blessing and the institution of what it means. Father, we thank you so much for our church family and pray that you will continue to bless us in all that we do and certainly continue to bless our church family here as we continue to walk with you as we strive to do your will, even during these challenging times. We thank you for all of our members, for their love for you. We thank you for our leadership. We thank you for their families. We thank you for these men's heart and how much they love us and watch over us and pray that you'll bless them, especially in the difficult decisions sometimes with which they have to make and pray you'll watch over them and give them wisdom and strength and courage. We thank you so much for our deacons. Father, we know they continue to work behind the scenes even as we're away as a, as a congregation, but we know work continues to go forward and we're thankful for their work and their diligence and effort. And we pray that you'll bless them in their efforts as well as their families and Father, to bless all of us as we put our hands to the plow to continue to move forward to do your will as we continue to do our best to shine as lights in this community, to show people your son, to, to expound upon your love for people as you showed us through the cross of Calvary, and certainly that may, they might understand how important it is that they have eternity with you. We thank you for the country with which, in which we live. We thank you for the blessing of the freedom with which we enjoy. But Father, help us to understand freedoms are fleeting, but we understand that we always are free from sin and, and those things that betroth us and, and hamper us and keep us down as long as we walk lockstep with you and are in fellowship with you. We thank you for loving us through which you sent your son Jesus and showed us in such a great way. Father, help us to understand the importance of that and help us to understand that sometimes we can make mistakes, but we're so thankful that when we fall, we can pick ourselves up and continue to walk with you. Father, help us when we do fall short. Walk with us as you always do. Watch over those among us who are sick and hurting. Watch over those who are struggling spiritually or that are struggling in their faith. Help us to encourage them, but always help them to look towards you, Father. Thank you for loving us, for walking with us, for Jesus. And it's in his name we do humbly ask this prayer. Amen. So over the last several weeks, we've looked through and understanding the role of the family, obviously in that harmonious state in which we want the family to be in. And, and we've covered several different things as we've looked at the homes in harmony. We touched a lot on communication and the importance of communication. We talked about how the marriages can break down. Uh, we've looked at the idea of finances in which we discussed last week and the difficulties that couples can have, certainly as they're traversing through difficult times and debt and all of those other things. But there's something I want us to discuss today, and we just have a few classes left, but there's something I want us to discuss today that certainly I believe is a sensitive topic. It's, it's a multifaceted topic. It's a difficult topic. There's certainly a matter of opinions in which we go about understanding this in, in relation to keeping ha harmony within the homes, and that's today I want us to discuss children. And when we're going to look at marital harmony and children at the same time, children can bring about difficulties. Now, that's not to say it's the children's fault, but as parents in, which, in the way in which we allow these things to progress, when it comes to discipline, when it comes to whatever facet in which we're going to discuss children today, and we'll discuss several different things, they can cause rifts within a family, especially if there's not agreement over certain issues concerning children. I always tell couples when I um, counsel them concerning premarital counseling that this is something that they need to discuss before they say their vows. They really need to discuss seriously with how they're going to approach having children in relation to it's not just the joy of having children, but also remember that it's, it's certainly 
it's certainly the joy of having children, but it's what comes with the children for the next 18, 20, 25 years. And if you have children that still live at home, it can continue to go on. But what I'm talking about in relation to when I talk to these young couples and talking about having children, that they discuss how many children they want to have, the finances concerning those children, when they want to have these children, you know, again, how many children and discipline and all of these other multifaceted areas that come into play that you really have to think about when it comes to bringing a child into this world. But more importantly, that you understand that you want to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, as Paul discusses in Ephesians 6 and verse 4. And so the home and its parent-child relationships, unfortunately, is being torn apart today. And that's because of, you know, child abuse, parent abuse, uh, you know, uh, or rather parental abuse, separation, divorce, neglect, worldliness. All of these things can affect the harmony in the home when it comes to children. Children are a great responsibility. It's not just a toy. It's not something that we think might be a good idea for a time period. I always tell these young couples when you get ready to have children that this is a serious responsibility with which you need to prepare yourself and everything that comes with that responsibility. The home is a spiritual relationship that was established by God for man's good and for God's glory. With that, we also want to make sure that we're rearing our children in the shadow, so to speak, of God's glory, that we're bringing them up, that they might glorify the Lord, that they see the importance of what it means to be in a Christian home. The home continues to play a major role in God's plan for mankind. Unfortunately, as we see today with the statistics concerning divorce, something that I discussed in the beginning of this, this, um, this class when we began several weeks ago, is that we're seeing more families divorcing, families breaking down, children without the proper roles within the home and all of these different things that bring about difficulties. But God's charged the home with the responsibility to bear and to rear children. And when we take on that responsibility, really what we have to remember is that we're being good stewards of something with which God has blessed us. And so we need to produce for God. That's what it means to be a steward to make sure that our children are going to also bring glory to God as well too. And so it takes a lot to rear children than it, than it does to bear them. And, and really both can be painful, right? I say that in jest, but what I want us to understand is the seriousness with which we go about this class today and understanding the role that we have and that we play with rearing our children to make sure that they glorify God and that we do our part to bring them up in the nurture and admission of the Lord. God established biblically, when you think about it, sanction roles within each family. The father, the mother, the children all have specific roles to play, and God bears that out for us in Scripture. When you think about the parent-child relationships in the home and in the church, everyone needs to understand their roles within the confines of that nuclear family that God has designed. Again, we go back to a Scripture that we've looked at several times in Genesis 2, 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That is, they're joined together that they are now the unit with which God has designed that unit to be and what he says the family should look like. The problem is man has gotten in the way with the design of God's family and the way in which God wants his family to look. But with those design roles, the husband certainly has a great responsibility to love their wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The father is to be the protector. The father is to be the leader of the family, to bury and carry that responsibility to lead his family to eternity. If the man does not take that role, unfortunately it falls by the wayside and the children then also take on that same mindset of saying that following God is not as important. Wives have a specific responsibility in Titus 2, 4, and 5 that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So we, we've understood and we see the role of the husband is to love his wife, to protect his wife, to look out for his children, to rear his children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. But the wife there, there too also has a responsibility to, what does it say? To love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands so that the word of God is not blasphemed. So that's a serious charge then given. Ephesians chapter 6, the first three verses, Paul gives instructions 
to the children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. The first thing he says is, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is what God expects of children today. But for us to understand, or rather for us to help our children, we need to teach them what it means to obey. They need to see us obeying God ourselves. This all comes down with teaching our children what it means to obey God. So we're projecting and teaching them of what it means to follow after God and be obedient to the promises that God has given to us. And so we've understood the role of husbands, the understood of wives, of children, but also the respect through the years... The Bible tells us to listen to your father who begot you and do not despise your mother when she is old. So as these children grow, they are to also listen and then pay respects and to be mindful of their parents of whom God says they shall take care of as those parents get older. We discussed this a few classes ago. Ephesians 6 and verse 4, that tells us that parents are to treat their children properly. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. But as we discuss the parent-child relationship today, bear in mind that a relationship means two closely related things. Just as we've talked about homes in harmony, right? That these two entities kind of dovetail together and are harmonious in that relationship. Well... It's the same thing that we're talking about today concerning that child and parent relationship. Too many times we treat people as things and we treat things as people. Good relationships do not automatically happen. They must be worked in all areas of our Christian lives. God gives us the tool with which and by how to work on these relationships that we are to establish. And certainly when we have our children, our children at a specific point when they're born or altricial. You have, you know, I studied wildlife biology in college, and so you have two animals when they're born, you have two distinct type of of animals. You have those that are altricial and those that are precocial. Precocial animals are one that begin to basically walk right after birth, and they're, they're up and they're moving about, and even some that are flying or whatever the case is. And then you have altricial animals that have to be nurtured along and watched after and fed and cared for. Well, This is what happens when we have children, right? Those children have to be nurtured and fed and cared for and watched after and protected. And they need to learn in that process of what it means to be obedient. Eventually, we want to teach our children how to be good stewards, to follow after as we give them responsibility as they grow and as they mature and as we teach them the ways of the Lord, as they're watching us and looking after us and watching over us, all of these things that we show them As we teach them, as we see in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're teaching them who God is. We're teaching them to love the Lord with all their heart and with all their mind and with all their soul. When these things do not happen, then what happens is we have children who grow up and we're only one generation away from children who do not know God. It's that close. So it's a responsibility with which we must take seriously. So as we discuss this, we need to bear in mind that A relationship requires work. So as parents, we have to work at our relationships with our children. Every set of parent and children have some measure of relationship, but the question we want to ask then as we go forward is what type of relationship do they have? Is it a good relationship? Is it a bad relationship? Is it a positive relationship? Is it a negative relationship? Is it an acceptable relationship? Is it unacceptable? What I mean by acceptable Do the children, do the parents know their defined roles that God has designed the home to be? Or are the parents trying to be friends to the children rather than the parents rearing the children? Unfortunately, you see that in many cases. Parents want to befriend their children. That's not to say that can't happen later in life. I consider my parents very close as friends that I can lean upon them and ask them for guidance. But that didn't happen overnight. There was a point with which I had to listen to them, respect them, obey them with what they told me to do. It's the same thing, therefore, I apply to my children. But as children grow older, the relationship changes. Is it acceptable or is it an unacceptable? Is it positive? Is it healthy? Is it sick? All of these things that we have to consider concerning a relationship. Another thing, is it conducive to growth and maturation and development? Does it stifle growth? There are so many things with that we have to look at concerning the relationships with our children because we want to make sure that it's in harmony with God's home. Are we 
a model relationship? Do our relationships need to be altered? Do our relationships need to be improved? There are so many things that we have to think about. A relationship is earned. A good one is earned because we do a good job. When you see people that we might be jealous of, so to speak, or jokingly jealous, I guess you can say, when we see a mother and daughter who have a wonderful and close-knit relationship, do we think that just happened overnight? Do we think that just happened all of a sudden? No, I'm sure that it took time to develop that. And that's not to say they don't have troubles. But a poor one is earned when we neglect our relationships with our children. Good relationships, again, do not happen automatically. They have to be worked at. Simply having children does not make anyone a good parent any more than sitting at a piano makes one a good pianist. It has to be worked at. It has to be practiced. If you're a parent, you know that when your children were born, you were not really given an instruction manual, were you? There were not all of these diagrams and pictures that were broken down to show you how to change diapers and, and feed babies and make bottles and all of these other things that came with having children. A lot of that was really OJT, right? It was on-the-job training. You went through the process, trial and error. You made mistakes. You helped them grow. You fell short. You encouraged them. There are so many things that we look at, but when failure comes, we have to understand that the failure has to be addressed. And when failure comes in the home, it's not that the home has a divinely appointed institution that has failed, but rather the people have failed in their divinely appointed jobs, keeping harmony in the homes. When children are brought into the picture, harmony must also remain but one of the things I said from the onset of this class concerning children several weeks ago when that came down to the idea of communication too, that remember God comes first, spouse comes second, and children come last. That's the way God designed it to be. Children need to see that type of relationship and to respect that type of relationship. It's a relationship where love is offered, and this love that is offered has some very important qualities, and three of them are respect, or understanding, but also knowing limits. When you think about the purpose of the parent relationship, that purpose of that relationship is to be something with which a child can grow. And so the purpose of us being parents, supporting our children, and establishing that relationship is helping them grow. That way they learn these three things that we're going to talk about, and that first being respect. I speak not of the respect of children towards parents, but I hope that parents certainly can earn that because respect is something earned. It's not given. It's not something with which we can demand. I'm speaking of the parents' respect for their children. This means several things, some obvious, and some certainly are more subtle. That is, there are certain things that we respect about our children as they're growing that's going to help them grow into the adults that we want them to be, but more importantly, that God wants them to be. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 says, To train up our children... What? In the way of the Lord, and when, he is, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Well, when you think about that verse, it's not the idea of bringing them up in relation to bringing them up in the church. And I've heard preachers say that. Well, if you bring them up in the church, then when they're old, they're never going to depart from it. That's not what the Bible is talking about. Bring up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they're not going to depart from it. The way in which the child is bent, geared, and the way in which they're raised Every child, if you have children, I have four, and all four of my children are completely different from the others. None of them are alike whatsoever, though they've been reared the same. None of them are the same. Each of them has a specific characteristic, a specific um, mold, so to speak, a way in which they do things, a different demeanor. That some are introverted, some are extroverted. None of those things are bad, but I have to gear the way in which I raise them to the type of child that they are to nurture them in such a way that it's going to benefit them and not stunt them. This is where we have to respect not so much boundaries per se, because as parents we have a right to set those boundaries, but the idea of respecting who that child is and what that child is going to grow up to be, respecting their possessions and the things they hold dear, respecting their dependence upon you, not expecting the worst from them, but trust that this man be the person in which they want you to be as the father, respecting their choices and their preferences within boundaries and molding them to make good choices and having the right preferences, respecting their identity and their right to grow, all of these things that we have to nurture and bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But also it's important to have understanding. Now, the gift of knowing what is good or what it must be like to be in the other shoes and how one would feel if they were is called empathy and understanding. It's 
understanding our children for who they are, not for who we want or think that they should be when they grow up. It's the ability to share joy and grief in a sense, in the sense the capacity to be a child or letting our children be children on occasions or being more serious on occasions. The difficult part about all of this understanding is that the parent must know what it feels like to be a child. We've all been there. So we've got to allow them to make mistakes, to fall short sometimes because this is going to help them grow and develop. And it also helps to maintain that relationship. But they need to also understand limits. The ability to let the children learn what life is really about is allowing ourselves or giving ourselves limits. We have to give them enough rope, so to speak. We have to allow them to experience life. We can't smother them because when we do that, we stifle their growth. We have to allow them to experience things. A lot of what we call helping, really, brethren, is meddling. And that's natural because we love our children. We want to protect them, but you were a child once too. You wanted to grow. You wanted to experience things and do things. A relationship that helps produces love, but it also must be forgiving, warm, honest, and it must be loving. You don't help a child by giving it a blank check in life. There are ways in which we help our children grow that the home might maintain its harmony between the parent and the child relationships. Parents should also understand that, that concerning knowledge of the needs of their children. Children from birth need proper nutrition and clothing and care and protection and protection from their own impulses. A lot of things with which we have to watch over. Children must have a good emotional climate to, with which they can grow and they can mature. All of these things we have to take into consideration. Children, children have to feel safe and wanted. Their families looking forward to being with them. All of these things are going to help our children be healthy and happy and grow. With that, the product with which we are giving them to be basically to, to grow into what we want them to develop into concerning glorifying God, that's our ultimate goal. All of these things will help us to, to reach that task. But unfortunately, many children don't have assurance. Many children don't have love. They don't have support. They don't feel wanted. They don't feel respected. All of those things can begin to falter and hurt a child's growth, which then can affect harmony in the home. And you have children that are lashing out, discipline problems, children that are depressed, anxious, whatever the case is, whatever label you want to throw on it begins to happen. Every child needs to be directed. Some parents, unfortunately, allow televisions to be babysitters and to be parents or iPads and phones and all of these other things instead of parents spending the time with the children that they should. As children grow older, they must know that they can trust the people who are responsible for them, that they can trust us to be there for them as we help them grow. Children develop a conscience. They need to look to their parents for a value system, maintaining harmony within the home. So increasingly, as children grow older, they have to feel that their parents trust them, that they have confidence in their inherent goodness because we've raised them in such a way. We're trying to get them to the point as we maintain the harmony within homes and the parents and children understand the boundaries within those relationships, we want to be able to <coughs> excuse me, get to a point that our children, when they're ready to walk out the door, they're ready to face the devil in the world because that's what's waiting for them. That's remain, maintaining the harmony within the home. Basic trust and needs need to be built up very early for proper spiritual guidance. And so this is really what I want to kind of talk about as we go through the latter part of this class is offering some practical suggestions to maintaining a good parent-child relationship. So every home should teach its members and train them to respect for God, for home, for self, for fellow man, for government, God's word, morality, all of these things. We need to teach and help them understand what it means to respect all of those things. Again, looking at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, it tells us to not provoke our children to wrath. But again, going back to uh, Proverbs 22 and verse 6, to train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. We need to know our children to train our children, right? We need to talk with them, not talk at them. We need to teach them to have respect and live respect before themselves. Discipline. In the shape, and, and, and again, I'm not telling you how to discipline your children because every person disciplines differently, and that's a very sensitive area. But discipline is a form of love. 
God talks about the sparing of the rod. Spare the rod, spoil the child, so to speak. The idea of discipline is helping children to understand that it's done out of a basis of love that that might protect them later in life. Chastise, but don't beat them, so to speak. Again, be in control of both yourself and the situation when we're disciplining our children. We must be willing to say also when we make mistakes that I'm sorry and why I made a mistake. All of these things help to maintain harmony in the home. I cannot tell you how many parents I've had come to me who are struggling with disciplining their children later in life who are then 16, 17, some even 18, 19 years old that don't respect them. Well, what I always do is I have to go backwards in that relationship to the starting point with which that started and where the home broke down and there was no longer harmony. A lot of times, unfortunately, it's the parent's fault because the parent allowed those things to happen. They didn't teach them the proper respect and discipline and obedience and all of those things and setting limits and establishing what it means to be respected and to also have respect. But when we think about the idea of our children being dependent and consistent and we want them to be fruitful and we want them to be happy and all of these things, that starts with us as parents with maintaining harmony within homes and the walls of those, those, those houses starts with us. And it starts when our children are born. It's very essential, as I tell young couples, that you start the moment that child is born. You start to lay the foundation to help them mature and to grow because what you ultimately want them to do is put on Christ in baptism. You're the tool and God has given you the tools within His Word to help that happen. That's how we maintain harmony within our homes. In today's world of microwave speed, channel surfing, and drive through everything, including weddings. Words like tradition, family roots, legacy seem to fit more comfortably into discussion rather than putting them into play and making those things happen. One of the most important things we have to offer children is ourselves, someone they can trust, someone they can depend on, someone they can lean on, and someone they can learn from. And so God says we have a great responsibility it's a characteristic of humankind to want a pattern, an example, a model, right? We want to, to know how to do this. How do we do this? How do we raise our children? How do you raise your children? How are your children so good and do so well in school and seem so adjusted and well-mannered and all of these things? But what they don't see is everything and all of the work that went into that. Several years ago when, when my boys were little, I, I think my oldest son at the time was probably maybe seven or eight my youngest son was, I think, in kindergarten, maybe preschool at the time. And we went into a Mennonite store. And it was you know, like a grocery store, and we bought some things. And our boys followed behind, didn't say anything. We taught our boys from a very early age to be respectful and say, yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And when we got done, as we walked up to the counter, the boys stood there quietly. And when we got done, we'd giving them a piece of candy just for being good as a reward. It wasn't something that we promised them at the beginning. We just did that. And as we were standing there, the gentleman that was running the store told us, he said, your children are very well disciplined and very well mannered. You should be, you should be commended for that. And we got in the car and we laughed that, hey, if they're telling us, then we must be doing something right. I say that in jest in relation to understanding that when people would tell us that our, our boys were good and we were blessed with good boys, your boys are well-mannered, and, and you, you're so blessed to have good children. They didn't see the struggles and the difficulties that we had with getting them to that point. Consistency, love, a pattern, respect, showing our children the way. It was a constant effort of work and of love and of desire and of want and knowing that we were trying to teach them to walk in the way of the Lord. It wasn't something that happened overnight. There were difficulties. There were times when the home was not harmonious because we were struggling with raising them or whatever else the thing is. What I'm trying to say is this. God's plan for the home is man's desire to follow God and give Him the glory. God is giving us a great responsibility of everything that we've talked about up until this point from marriage to the point of having children and rearing children and raising them and then getting into our latter years and enjoying grandchildren God has given us the responsibility, but He's also given us the tools to help our children grow, to mature our marriages, to fix problems, to walk in the way of the Lord. So we're never without those things that God wants us to be with. And so when we think about this, 
Amazon lists over 10,000 book titles under the subject of parenting. But friends, this is all that you need. If you follow this book, I guarantee you that it's going to be a lot easier. Man has a lot of ideas, but when we follow after the pattern with which God has given us to rear our children, to nurture them, to help them grow, to help them be successful in life, to help them pick themselves up when they make mistakes, to show them who God is when they make mistakes, how God will pick them up, then we're giving our children the tools to succeed in life, but also we're giving them the tools to rear their own children. Isn't that really what it's about, of building a legacy of eternity and righteousness with God, that we want to, to see our seed line a hundred years from now be faithful to the Lord based upon who we were because we set the example for them. I know I've said it before, and as I close, I, one of my, the first funerals I did was for a lady by the name of Zula Witherington who was 99 years old. She had eight children, 18 grandchildren, and 43 great-grandchildren, all of which were faithful and she's the one that started it. One of her sons was a gospel preacher, but she's the one that started Faithful Life and Service, and she reared her children in the same pattern. It only took one person. Look at the number of generations that are blessed because of it. So we have a great responsibility, and certainly in the way in which we rear our children are going to bring about that which God desires of us. So I pray this has helped. pray this has encouraged you, as always, if you have any questions. Please feel free to reach out. I'm praying for you, praying for your family, looking forward to when we can be back together and certainly looking forward to being able to worship together in just a, sh a few short moments. Have a wonderful and blessed week. Take care and may God richly bless you.